Herman Webster Mudgett, better known under the name of Dr. Henry Howard Holmes or more commonly H. H. Holmes, was one of the first documented serial killers in the modern sense of the term. While he confessed to 27 murders, of which nine were confirmed, he may have killed as many as 200 people. He brought an unknown number of his victims to his World's Fair Hotel, located about three miles west of the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Besides being a serial killer, H. H. Holmes was also a successful con artist and a bigamist. Early Life Holmes was born as Herman Webster Mudgett in Gilmanton, New Hampshire, on May 16, 1861, to Levi Horton Mudgett and Theodate Page Price, both of whom were descended from the first English settlers in the area. Mudgett was his parents' third-born child. He had an older sister Ellen, an older brother Arthur and a younger brother Henry. Holmes later recalled that at first, he was frightened, but then found the experience fascinating. He also wrote the experience cured him of his fears. Holmes soon became obsessed with death and later started a hobby of dissecting animals. At the age of 16, Holmes graduated from high school and took teaching jobs in Gilmanton and later in Alton, New Hampshire. On July 4, 1878, he married Clara Lovering in Alton. Their son, Robert Lovering Mudgett, was born on February 3, 1880, in Loudoun, New Hampshire. As an adult, Robert became a certified public accountant and served as city manager of Orlando, Florida. At the age of 18, Holmes enrolled in the University of Vermont in Burlington, but was dissatisfied with the school and left after only one year. In 1882, he entered the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery. On January 28, 1887, while he was still married to Clara, Holmes married Murta Belknap. B. October 1862 in Pennsylvania, Illinois and the Murder Castle. Holmes arrived in Chicago in August 1886 and came across Elizabeth S. Holton's drugstore at the southwest corner of South Wallace Avenue and West 63rd Street in the Englewood neighborhood. Holmes purchased an empty lot across from the drugstore, where he built his three-story block-long hotel building. Because of its enormous structure, local people dubbed it the castle. The building was 162 feet long and 50 feet wide. The address was 601 to 603 West 63rd Street. During the period of building construction in 1889, Holmes met and became close friends with Benjamin Pitezel, a carpenter with a criminal past. He used Pitezel as his right-hand man for his criminal schemes. A district attorney later described Pitezel as Holmes' tool, his creature. Quote. After the completion of the hotel, Holmes selected mostly female victims from among his employees, many of whom were required as a condition of employment to take out life insurance policies, for which Holmes would pay the premiums, but was also the beneficiary, as well as his lovers and hotel guests, whom he would later kill. Through the connections he had gained in medical school, he sold skeletons and organs with little difficulty. One victim was his mistress, Julia Smythe. She was the wife of Ned Connor, who had moved into Holmes' building and began working at his pharmacy's jewelry counter. Holmes began an affair with Smythe. After Connor found out about the affair, he quit his job and moved away, leaving Smythe and her daughter Pearl behind. Smythe gained custody of Pearl and remained at the hotel, continuing her affair with Holmes. In 1891, Smythe told Holmes that she was pregnant with his baby and demanded marriage. Holmes agreed to marry her but told her that they could not have a child. He then suggested performing an abortion, and she agreed. The abortion was planned for Christmas Eve. Holmes murdered Smythe by overdosing her with chloroform and later killed Pearl, when confronted by a tenant in the building, who questioned the whereabouts of Smythe and her daughter.
Holmes said that they had left for Iowa to attend a family wedding. After Christmas, Holmes hired a man named Charles Chappell to articulate Smythe's skeleton. Holmes introduced himself to Chappell as Henry Gordon and took him to one of the rooms on the second floor to show him the body. After some discussion, they agreed that Chappell would put the arms in a bag and take them home to be articulated and Holmes would do the rest of the body. After Chappell arrived home with the arms, Holmes and another man, possibly Pitezel, showed up at the door and gave him the rest of the body, which had been cut into two pieces. Holmes later hired Chappell again and took him to the same room, this time to process the body of a man. The third job was for the body of another woman. After Chappell finished the third skeleton, Holmes refused to pay the money he owed him. Due to some financial trouble, Chappell then refused to give Holmes back the skeleton and kept it inside his home. After Holmes was caught and his crimes became public, Chappell cooperated with the police and gave them the skull for examination. The room where Holmes kept the three bodies was later established by investigators as the room of the three corpses. Quote, Holmes met a railroad heiress named Minnie Williams while on a business trip in Boston. He introduced himself to her as Henry Gordon. Quote, they started dating and then entered into a relationship. Although Holmes had to return to Chicago, he kept in touch with Williams and sent her love letters. In February 1893, she moved to Chicago and contacted Holmes. He offered her a job at the hotel as his personal stenographer, and she accepted. After rekindling their relationship, Holmes was able to persuade Williams to transfer the deed to her property in Fort Worth, Texas to a man named Alexander Bond, an alias of Holmes. In April 1893, Williams transferred the deed, with Holmes serving as the notary. Holmes later signed the deed over to Pitezel, giving him the alias Benton T. Lyman. After proposing to Williams, Holmes encouraged her to invite her sister Annie to Chicago, and she accepted the invitation. Holmes eventually started a friendship with Annie Williams and even gave her a personal tour of the hotel. While working in his office, Holmes asked Annie to go inside his office vault to get a file for him. While she was inside the vault, Holmes locked her inside and turned on the gas line that led to the vault, killing her. At about the same time, Minnie Williams also vanished. Quote, Capture and Arrest Following the World's Fair with creditors closing in and the economy in a general slump due to the Panic of 1893, Holmes left Chicago. He reappeared in Fort Worth, Texas, where he had inherited property from the Williams sisters. There, he sought to construct another castle along the lines of his Chicago operation. However, he soon abandoned this project. He continued to move throughout the United States and Canada. The only murders verified during this period were those of longtime associate Pitezel and three of Pitezel's children. In July 1894, Holmes was arrested and briefly incarcerated for the first time on the charge of selling mortgaged goods in St. Louis, Missouri. He was promptly bailed out, but while in jail he struck up a conversation with a convicted train robber named Marion Hedgepeth who was serving a 25-year sentence. Holmes had concocted a plan to swindle an insurance company out of $10.000 oh, 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 by taking out a policy on himself and then faking his death. Holmes promised Hedgepath a $500 commission in exchange for the name of a lawyer who could be trusted. Holmes was directed to a young street. Lewis attorney named Jephtha Howe. Howe was in practice with his older brother. Alfonso Howe, who had no involvement with Holmes or Pitezel or their fraudulent activities. Jephtha Howe, however, found Holmes' scheme brilliant. Nevertheless, Holmes' plan to fake his own death failed when the insurance company became suspicious and refused to pay. Holmes did not press the claim. Instead he concocted a similar plan with his associate Pitezel. Pitezel had agreed to fake his own death so that his wife could collect on a 
000 life insurance policy, which she was to split with Holmes and the unscrupulous attorney, Jephthah Howe. The scheme, which was to take place in Philadelphia, was that Pitezel would set himself up as an inventor, under the name B. F. Perry, and then be killed and disfigured in a lab explosion. Holmes was to find an appropriate cadaver to play the role of Pitezel. Holmes instead killed Pitezel by knocking him unconscious with chloroform and setting his body on fire with a use of benzene. In his confession, Holmes implied that Pitezel was still alive after he used the chloroform on him. Prior to being set on fire, he proceeded to collect the insurance payout on the basis of the genuine Pitezel corpse. Holmes then went on to manipulate Pitezel's unsuspecting wife into allowing three of her five children, Alice, Nellie, and Howard, to be in his custody. The eldest daughter and the baby remained with Mrs. Pitezel. Forensic evidence presented at Holmes' later trial showed that chloroform had been administered after Pitezel's death, a fact which the insurance company was unaware of presumably to fake suicide in order to exonerate Holmes should he be charged with murder. Holmes and the three Pitezel children traveled throughout the northern United States and into Canada. Simultaneously, he escorted Mrs. Pitezel along a parallel route, all the while using various aliases and lying to Mrs. Pitezel concerning her husband's death, claiming that Pitezel was hiding in London. In 1894, the police were tipped off by Holmes' former cellmate Hedgepeth, whom Holmes had neglected to pay off as promised for his help in providing attorney Jephthah Howe. The police began interviewing the castle's employees. The caretaker, Pat Quinlan, informed police that he was never allowed to clean the second floor. The police began a thorough investigation over the course of a month, uncovering Holmes' torture chambers and secret passageways on the upper floors. Inside a large stove on the third floor, they found a piece of a gold chain, women's hair, and a woman's shoe. Suspecting that the chain belonged to Minnie Williams, they took it to a local jeweler, who had sold jewelry to Minnie in the past, who confirmed that it was hers. The police later looked inside Holmes' office vault and found several scratch marks, and a mark of what appeared to be a woman's shoe. Holmes later stated in his confession that the shoe print in the vault came from Annie Williams. During her violent struggle before dying, when the police finished the upper floors, they moved their investigation down to the basement. They found a pile of human bones mixed with animal bones, a dissection table covered with dried blood, and a pile of bloody women's clothes. The investigators dug up the lime pits and found skeletal remains of Holmes' victims. The lime had turned most of the remains into dust, but they identified two strands of hair, one brown and one fair, in two soft spots in the hard clay. The strands matched the respective hair colors of Minnie and Annie Williams. Investigators also found a pile of lime with a female footprint on it. They suspected that the footprint came from Minnie. They also looked inside the acid pit and found several bones at the bottom. In one part of the basement, investigators unearthed several bones belonging to a child estimated to be six to eight years old. They also found a dress that they suspected had belonged to Julia Smythe. They later showed the dress to Connor, who confirmed it was hers. Three firemen later explored a nearby tunnel that led from the basement to the street. The tunnel ended in a hollow-sounding wall. After the firemen had torn it down, a plumber lit at a match for illumination and accidentally caused an explosion powerful enough to shake the whole building. Several of the men were injured and had to be taken to the hospital. Afterwards, investigators found the fumes that caused the explosion were coming from an oil tank hidden behind the wall. Holmes had no explanation for the oil tank but the chemists who examined the oil stated that the fumes were strong enough to kill someone in less than a minute. Holmes later stated that the bodies that were found in the basement were bought from a man who stole them from a local cemetery, but he could name neither the man nor the cemetery.
Only nine murders were confirmed, but the number of his victims has been estimated between 20 and 100, and even as high as 200. Some of the names listed in the confession, for which the Philadelphia Inquirer paid him, turned out to be those of people still alive. Although police had commented that some of the bodies in the basement were so badly dismembered and decomposed that it was difficult to tell how many bodies there actually were, Holmes' victims were mainly women, primarily blonde, but included men and children. Trial, Execution and Aftermath Holmes sat in prison in Philadelphia after confessing to the insurance scam, while sentencing was delayed until after the trial of Howe, his co-conspirator in the insurance fraud. Meanwhile, Chicago police had begun an investigation of his operations in that city. As the Philadelphia police sought to unravel the Pitezel situation, in particular, the fate of the three missing Pitezel children, Alice, Nellie, and Howard, Detective Gare was tasked with finding answers. His quest for the children, like the search of Holmes Castle in Chicago, received wide publicity. His eventual discovery of their remains essentially sealed Holmes' fate, at least in the public mind. I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer. No more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one, standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world, and he has been with me since. Quote. In October 1895, Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Benjamin Pitezel, and was found guilty and sentenced to death. By then, it was evident that Holmes had also murdered the Pitezel children. Following his conviction, Holmes confessed to 30 murders in Chicago. Indianapolis and Toronto, though some he confessed to murdering were, in fact, still living, and six attempted murders. Holmes was paid $7.500, worth $216.000 today, by the Hearst newspapers in exchange for his confession. Holmes gave various contradictory accounts of his life, initially claiming innocence and later that he was possessed by Satan. His propensity for lying has made it difficult for researchers to ascertain the truth on the basis of his statements. While writing his confessions in prison, Holmes mentioned how drastically his facial appearance had changed since his imprisonment. He described his new, grim appearance as gruesome and taking a satanical cast, and wrote that he was now convinced that, after everything that he had done, he was beginning to resemble the devil. On May 7, 1896, Holmes was hanged at Moya Mensing Prison, also known as the Philadelphia County Prison, for the murder of Benjamin Pitezel. The U.S. Post Office in Englewood, built in 1939 partially on the site of the demolished murder castle. On New Year's Eve 1909, Hedgepeth, who had been pardoned for informing on Holmes, was shot and killed by police officer Edward Jabarik during a hold-up at a Chicago saloon. On March 7, 1914, the Chicago Tribune reported that, with the death of Quinlan, the former caretaker of the murder castle, the mysteries of Holmes Castle would remain unexplained. Quinlan had committed suicide by taking strychnine. His body was found in his bedroom with a note that, read, I couldn't sleep, quote, the murder castle was mysteriously gutted by fire in August 1895, according to a newspaper clipping from the New York Times. Two men were seen entering the back of the castle between 8 and 9 p.m. About a half an hour later, they were seen exiting the building and rapidly running away. Following several explosions, the castle went up in flames. Afterwards, Investigators found a half-empty gas can underneath the back steps of the building. Some people. Media. This section appears to contain trivial, minor, or unrelated references to popular culture. Please reorganize this content to explain the subject's impact on popular culture rather than simply listing appearances. Add references to reliable sources if possible. 
otherwise delete it. The case was notorious in its time and received wide publicity through a series of articles in William Randolph Hearst's newspapers. Interest in Holmes's crimes was revived in 2003 by Eric Larson's The Devil in the White City, Murder, Magic, and Madness at the Fair That Changed America, a best-selling non-fiction book that juxtaposed an account of the planning and staging of the World's Fair with Holmes's story. His story had been previously chronicled in The Tortured Doctor by David Frank and Depraved, the shocking true story of America's first serial killer by Harold Schechter, as well as the monster of 63rd Street Chapter and Gem of the Prairie, an informal history of the Chicago underworld by Herbert Asbury, the 1974 novel American Gothic by horror writer Robert Block was a fictionalized version of the story of H. H. Holmes Films a documentary film on Holmes. H. H. Holmes, America's First Serial Killer, was released in 2004. Narrated by Tony J., the producer and director of the film, John Barofsky, also wrote a book on Holmes titled The Strange Case of Dr. H. H. Holmes, Devil in the White City, an upcoming film starring Leonardo DiCaprio as Holmes is set to be directed by Martin Scorsese and written by Billy Ray, based on the book of the same name. The film will follow Daniel H. Burnham's construction of the 1893 World's Fair, as well as Holmes' building of his hotel. Television In episode 6 of the second season of Supernatural, which aired in November 2006, The Spirit of H. H. Holmes is haunting an apartment building in Philadelphia and continuing to kill Dean Winchester. Sam Winchester and Joe Harville investigate and trap Holmes' spirit within tunnels, where he can't cause any more harm. Holmes was featured in the Killers Without Conscience episode of documentary TV series Americ's Serial Killers, Portraits and Evil. The documentary also speculated that Holmes was the inspiration for the 1932 film Dr. X. Episode 3 of the first season of the History Channel's Haunted History TV series, airing in July 2013, was dedicated to Holmes and the Murder Castle. American Horror Story, Hotel, the fifth season of that series, predominantly takes place in a hotel and features a character named James March played by Evan Peters, who is said to be modeled after Holmes. In episode 3 of the first season of Elevator, which aired in November 2015, the contestants participated in a challenge about the story and killing of H. H. Holmes. In episode 2, The Lying Detective, of the fourth series of Sherlock, which aired January 8, 2017, serial killer Culverton Smith was inspired by H. H. Holmes. In episode 11, The World's Columbian Exposition, of the first season of Timeless, which aired January 16, 2017, Wyatt and Rufus are led into the murder castle of H. H. Holmes, portrayed by Joel Johnston. Radio. The Murder Castle, episode of Lights Out, Archo Bowler's early radio horror series which aired on August 3, 1943, was inspired by H. H. Holmes. Theater Baltimore Rock Opera Society produced and performed a full-length original rock opera based on Holmes, titled Murder Castle, in May 2013. In June 2015, the Manhattan Repertory Theater produced Jared Mallard's play Amongst the Monsters, which details the life of H. H. Holmes. Podcasts. Other media. The author Anthony Boucher used H. H. Holmes as a pen name during the 1940s for murder mysteries and magazine reviews. Holmes was the subject of a song cycle, The Peculiar Case of Dr. H. H. Holmes, by composer Libby Larson which premiered in 2010. In the PC game Shadow Run Returns, 
A serial killer called the Emerald City Ripper uses the alias H. H. Holmes, and his main henchman is called Pitezel. The H. H. Holmes murder castle was illustrated by artist Holly Carden and turned into a 513-piece jigsaw puzzle, which she made available on January 11, 2016.